Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible, but were afraid to ask. I'm Katie Langston. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And today we're doing uh, what we call the, a lightning round. Woo-hoo. So it's it's just us two instead of having a guest as we usually do. Uh, because we, uh, as you know, uh, those, those of you who listen to this podcast, uh, we get questions from listeners. Uh, and if you want to submit a question, you can go to enterthebible.org to submit a question. Uh, Many of the questions are uh, are big topics, and that's when we invite a guest to help us address them. Uh, but sometimes we get some pretty small uh, questions, and so we can, they they don't uh, really necessitate you know a, a full episode. So we kind of combine a number of those small questions into uh, what we're calling a lightning round. So we've done these before, uh, and so we have four questions we're going to address uh, today. Yes. So the first one, and we'll take turns uh, uh, stating those questions. So the first one uh, is, who wrote the book of Daniel? Isn't it Daniel? <laughs> Didn't Daniel write the book of Daniel? <laughs> well, perhaps. Doesn't the book say that Daniel wrote the book of Daniel? <laughs> Maybe we start there. The Actually, book of Daniel, no. is it? Yeah. Should not. It it doesn't say who wrote it. Yeah, it never says I mean, it's, no, because it, it's not it, in the first person, is it? It's in the third right. person account. Well, th- uh, there are parts of it that are in the first person, right? Um, but the the majority of it does is told in, told in the third person. Mm. Uh, you know, this would be one of those questions. It would be uh, it's would be a good idea to go to enterthebible.org. Imagine that. Uh, we have lots of writing, lots of essays about every book of the Bible. And so when you go to enterthebible.org, you can uh, do the, you can click on the uh, tab that says books, uh, books of the Bible, uh, and And you can go down to Daniel. And there's uh, always a a summary of uh, of each book with questions like, uh, what's the what's the summary of the book? So what, right? What's the relevance? Where do right. I find it? Who who wrote it? Uh, and when was it written? What's it about? And how do I read it? So uh, uh, our uh, our friends uh, Dick Nicey, Richard Nicey, uh, who's now retired from Luther Seminary, longtime Old Testament professor here, uh, wrote the original. Uh, essays on Daniel, uh, and they were revised just last year by a former uh, professor here at Luther Seminary, Michael Chan, still a friend of the podcast. Uh, And basically, um, they say that uh, the book uh, is attributed to Daniel, uh, who was a Jewish exile who lived during the reigns of the Babylonian kings of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, uh, and the Persian kings, uh, Cyrus and Darius. So we're talking here, it's the first part of the book, uh, Daniel 1 through 6, uh, uh, is set in that time period of the Babylonian exile and then the diaspora, the time of the Persian empire. Uh, and the uh, uh, second half of the book, though, Daniel 7 through 12, uh, speaks about historical events in apocalyptic terms, mm. Uh, but historical events that actually uh, go all the way to the second century BCE, so uh, a few hundred years later than the Babylonian exile, because they they talk specifically those chapters about the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was a, mm. a, a Hellenistic uh, ruler, a Greek um, a ruler of uh, of of Judah, of the 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 land of Judah. Uh, and who uh, greatly persecuted the Jews. So whoever wrote the first part of Daniel, it seems that um, uh, the the last part or the final, the form of the book we have it in now uh, wasn't completed uh, until the second century BCE. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's always important to ask the question, what genre, like what type of literature is this that we're looking at? And, um, 
was recently preaching on the book of Daniel because it was a suggestion for a summer series in the narrative lectionary, which we use uh, at my church. And it kind of occurred to me as I was reading through it, um, I kind of like to think of it as like a comic book is sort of the genre. I mean, it's not a graphic novel, right? It doesn't have like pictures and, and whatever, but like sort of like a superhero tale, um, meaning that, um, you know, Daniel is a character who's put in these like foreign places uh, in the court of the king and in, in these different contexts. And, and the question, um, at least one of the questions the book is trying to to ask is how do we live faithfully in a foreign context? And Daniel and his friends um, are, you know, are uh, faithful Jews. And at the same time, you know, they're deeply engaged in the life of the community where they're living, right? They're interpreting dreams, they're serving the king, they're you know, but they're refusing to uh, worship idols, so they're thrown into fires and lions' dens, and and then there's so there's sort of like the first half of the book that's kind of those more exciting stories, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the second half of the book is a lot more like you were saying, apocalyptic in nature, meaning that it uses a lot of um, symbols and. Yeah kind of coded language coded symbols. language right to try so to to make that the, you know the point the various beasts and figures on right. horseback and they and it's it's coded language because you know if you were explicit about you know Antiochus for Epiphanes is a terrible man right you might uh, you might get in well, trouble you might get in trouble yeah much like the <laughs> book of revelation which never refers to rome but does refer a whole lot to babylon and it's right. pretty obvious that Babylon in the book of Revelation means Rome. Right. So, uh, but yeah, I, I like that idea of the book of Daniel as a, as a, a comic book, uh, cause there are some pretty heroic tales there and some, some humor too. Yeah. Um, for sure. And some pretty wild, you know, images. Yeah. But the, the point of the whole thing will, and this is true of apocalyptic literature in general, the, the point of the whole thing seems to be to give hope to those who are in the midst of persecution. Right. To, to say, you know, no matter how bad things look now, remain faithful. God is faithful. God is powerful. God will defeat evil, uh, including your enemies. So, yeah, it's a fun one. Um, and uh, it's OK that the Bible has a book that is maybe a superhero tale in a way. Right. Like that doesn't make <laughs> yeah, it yeah. Um, that doesn't make it not the word of God. So. Right. And 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 uh, along the same lines, whoever wrote the book of Daniel, and it could be a group of, you know, uh, it could be a person, it could be Daniel, right, right. living in the exile, um, that a later author then added on uh, in the second century BCE added on to the book. Uh, this is often the case, we think, with biblical books that they kind of take their final form, the form we know that they, that, that we know them in. Um, over the course of a, a, a an extended period of time, uh, so you know, taking older traditions, maybe even oral traditions, these stories about Daniel and his friends, uh, and then finally writing them down. You know, they're passed down orally, right? And then you write them down. Uh, so it, it that's our best guess, anyway. Cool. Yeah. All right, here we go. I've got a question for you now. Next uh, question. So how do different Bible translations interpret Esther 7.7? 7? And then the question asks specifically what the Lutheran understanding of Haman's actions are in this passage, particularly res- regarding the suggested that he suggestion that he intended to assault the queen. So I don't know if, if you, you know, want to give a definitive Lutheran answer, but <laughs> like what's going on, what's going on in this passage? Yeah. I- yeah, I'm not sure there's a Lutheran interpretation of this, uh, though right. I appreciate that question. Uh, sure. I, I should have probably looked if, if Martin Luther ever actually wrote about this verse, uh, but I did not do that. So I'm going to stick, put my Old Testament hat on and <laughs> just talk a bit sure. about the verse itself. So uh, so let me read it uh, 
one translation, uh, let's just pick the uh, um, the NIV. That's a, mm -hmm. a popular uh, translation. So the king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. So just okay. uh, to remind you of the story very quickly, uh, this is this is kind of the... Um, uh, the 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 point at which this is Esther's second banquet that she has invited her husband the king to. Uh, uh, this is in the Persian Empire, uh, and she's invited Haman, who is referred to several times in the Book of Esther as the enemy of the Jews. Uh, and Haman has tried to get the uh, or has gotten the king earlier in the book to issue this decree, basically condemning uh, the Jews to slaughter. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly because his pride has been hurt because uh, Mordecai, Esther's cousin, hasn't bowed down to, to Haman. So, yeah. so Esther, trying to save her people, uh, has invited the king and Haman to two different banquets. This is the second banquet, and she has just revealed uh, uh, her, you know, the king has said several times, tell me what you want, Esther, I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. And Esther finally says, I, I'm asking you for my life and for the life of my people uh, because we have been marked for, for um, slaughter, basically. And the king says, who would dare to do this? And she says, uh, Haman, you know, this, this Haman, this wicked Haman. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so Haman, who's thinking that he has this great honor to be dining with the king and queen, suddenly realizes that he's been trapped. Yep. Uh, and so the king, who's kind of, um, well, he's a buffoon, he's not really. The best. Uh, yeah, not yeah, the best. Not the best king. <laughs> he gets so angry that he leaves his queen, right? Leaves Esther in the company of Haven and goes out to the garden in a rage to cool off, I guess. Sure. So uh, Haman gets up. He realizes, uh, as the translation just said, the NIV, realizes that the king is really angry with him. And so he falls, uh, the Hebrew says he uh, basically falls at Esther's feet hmm. uh, and uh, realizing uh, uh, or, or pleading with her for his life. And that is in the Hebrew, pleading for his life uh, as regards his life. So it seems, but the king then uh, comes in and thinks that Haman is assaulting the queen right in front of him. And he says, you know, are you going to assault the queen r right in my presence? Like, how dare you, you know, do that? Uh, and then uh, and then they cover Haman, Haman's face with a veil, uh, and he's basically a dead man walking, right? He's, right? he's taken out and hanged on the gallows that he had built uh, for Mordecai. So this particular point, uh, so is Haman actually assaulting the queen uh, or... Is he doing something else? It seems pretty clear from the Hebrew, uh, especially since, since it says he's pleading for his life, yeah. that that's what he's doing, right? He's not he's not adding insult to injury and trying to assault the queen. He's simply, well, simply he's he's <laughs> begging for his life. Right. He's begging for his life, but of course it doesn't look good, right? Him sure, I mean, he's like maybe, maybe at falling her on feet. Esther's yeah. feet, right? Yeah, yeah, and she's probably. Uh, in this period, you know, reclining, uh, that's how they dined, right? The, the wealthy and the elites. Yeah, so it doesn't look good, but... But it doesn't seem like he has... I mean, obviously he has nefarious, you know, yeah. intentions towards her people. Right. But he's he's more concerned about his own life than trying to assault her, so... All right. All right. So, next question. Uh, three Number three out of four. Uh, how many kings attack King Jehoshaphat of Judah? So we looked this up. This was a good question. We looked this up in 2 Chronicles 20, and it appears the answer is three, right? The right. Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Munites. Me. Yeah. Me unites, menu, me unites, M E U, yeah. me unites, M E U N I T E S. <laughs> but then you said that in the Hebrew, yeah. the me unites was also 
from the Ammon. It's an uh, Ammonites. It says twice. Ammonites again. Huh. It says Ammonites twice with with a preposition meaning from or. Uh. So after the in the Hebrew it's something like after this the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them, more of the Ammonites, <laughs> or more people from the Ammonites, okay, uh, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Uh, but in the Greek translation of uh-huh. the Old Testament, uh-huh. which is known as the Septuagint, um, it has this word meonites, meonites, which occurs later in the book of Second Chronicles as well. Uh, and they don't, they're not like that. We know a lot about the Moabites and the Ammonites. Uh, the Meonites are not, uh, I think they're only mentioned here in second Chronicles. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but possibly from, uh, a, um, uh, uh, the town of Maon, which was eight and a half miles South of Hebron. So, uh, not really clear, uh, later in the chapter in verse 10, it says, see now, uh, the, uh, Jehoshaphat is praying, and he says, See now the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, Seir uh, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt. Uh, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession. So Jehoshaphat himself, not the narrator, says it's the Ammonites, the Moabites, and people from Mount Seir, which are the Edomites, oh. right? the, the people descended from Esau. So I, I assume that the listener had this question because they're wondering about this kind of discrepancy yeah. uh, between verse 1 uh, and right. verse 10, yeah, and maybe the discrepancy between the Hebrew and the Greek, mm-hmm. um, which is, of course, a larger question. Uh, it, it's, as you said, it seems clear that there's three Seem peoples to be three. coming up yeah. against Jehoshaphat, whether it's the Ammonites and the... Uh, Meonites, or whether it's the Edomites and the Ammonites and the Moabites, it's not completely clear. Inconclusive? It's inconclusive. And this brings up, I I think the larger point, of course, is that sometimes uh, the details of the Bible, um, well, sometimes the text, the Hebrew text, may be slightly, uh, uh, might have come down to us, uh, we say, corrupted, you know, in the process of copying down all these many mm-hmm. uh, texts, sometimes there's there's slight discrepancies, uh, say, be, like here between verse 1 and verse 10, uh, you know, and it can be the difference of just one or two letters. Right. It's, it's usually, uh, usually, well, pretty much always a very small uh, detail like this, right. like who, who besides the Ammonites and the Moabites came up against King Jehoshaphat. Uh, so, uh, and in those cases, when it seems like the Hebrew isn't completely, cl- when the Hebrew is not con- completely clear, uh, then uh, uh, translators will go to other, to, to the Septuagint, uh, mm-hmm. mostly. Which is the Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew. Which is the, the Greek Hebrew translation Old of Testament. the Old Testament, of mm-hmm. the Hebrew, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and so they'll, you know, they'll fill in from the, the Greek text. Yeah. Uh, or at le- and always, always, uh, at least in the in study Bibles, uh, I think most most good modern translations uh, they'll they'll do a little footnote just to note the Hebrew says this, but the Greek says that. So, um, fun yeah. fun bonus fun fact, uh, lightning fun fact is that the phrase "jump in Jehoshaphat" is a is a nineteenth century invention. Um, it's seen in the 1865 novel Paul Peabody by Percy Bolingbroke St. John, in which it says, by the shaken, jumping ghost of Jehoshaphat. Ah, so that's where Jehoshaphat. that comes from. So right. there you have it. Okay. We do not know that the biblical Jehoshaphat was Jumped. particularly prone to jumping. Right. We There's no, it's, it doesn't say. It it it, it seems does. it seems to be just an alliteration. Jumping <laughs> Jehoshaphat. He was not the inventor of the trampoline. We're saying <laughs> no, I don't, not not that we're aware. Yes. I love it. All right, last question. Okay, so um, were pearls common in Jesus's time? And would Israelites have been familiar with them, given their scarcity 
in the Mediterranean. And I'm certain that this is um, coming from the, uh, the, the verse where Jesus tells people not to cast their pearls before swine. Um, so how did Jesus even know about pearls, Catherine? That's that's a really interesting question, and I, I have to admit I had to do some research on this. It's exciting. I've never, never really thought about pearls uh, in the Bible. I will mention that they they come up uh, in uh, in Matthew a couple of times. So the the passage that you uh, mentioned, Katie, in Matthew seven: Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine. Yeah, or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Uh, and then again in Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And on finding one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Uh, it does occur, uh, the, the, the word for pearls occurs uh, a few other passages in the New Testament. Uh, uh, First Timothy doesn't want women to braid their hair uh, uh, or to wear gold or pearls or expensive clothes. And then in Revelation, uh, uh, the uh, uh, woman uh, uh, representing Rome is clothed in purple and scarlet uh, and is adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's mentioned a, a few other times, probably most famously in Revelation 21, uh, the 12 gates of the New Jerusalem are 12 pearls. Each of the gates is a single pearl, and the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. So that's that's where we so, get the sort of trope of the pearly gates. Exactly. Ah, yep. cool. That's right. exactly right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, interestingly, uh, well, first of all, uh, it seems clear that um, Israel, or in this case, uh, the Jews, did know what pearls were because here it is several times it, several times in the new testament uh pearls are apparently found in the red sea uh really? even today so you know the the sea between uh well on the coast of sinai uh so between israel and egypt uh or now within egypt i suppose uh and they're found in the persian gulf so it's true that they uh, that they're rare in the Mediterranean, apparently naturally occurring pearls, um, but they're in these other two bodies of water that are not that far mm -hmm. from uh, from Judah. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember, right? All of this region is part of the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. and there's lots of trade going back and forth, uh, particularly between Egypt and Mesopotamia and between all, you know, and they have to go through Israel or through Judah in order to do those those trade routes. Uh, this was true in Old Testament times as well as New Testament times. Uh, and uh, obviously trade over to Rome as well and, uh, and to Greece. And I, I mean, we see this in the book of Acts, right? Paul right, is he's a all around. world traveler. Right? Yeah. He's all around the Mediterranean, or at least the eastern side of the Mediterranean. So even though the Mediterranean doesn't have many pearls, both the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf do have huh. naturally occurring pearls. So it does seem uh, that they would have been aware of that. What I found really interesting, though, as I was doing this research, is uh, pearls in the Roman Empire, particularly in the first century, uh, the first century BC and the first century BCE, uh, they were highly, highly value, valued. Huh. Uh, they were considered more valuable than diamonds. Wow. Apparently, because they were so rare. Huh. Uh, and uh, uh, apparently Julius Caesar, uh, you know, uh, in the first century BC, uh, he had a law or, or uh, decreed a law that only the upper classes could wear pearls huh. uh, within the borders of Rome. Uh, there's a uh, Pliny the Elder, a uh, Roman, um, Roman writer right. uh, of the first century CE. Uh, he doesn't like women wearing pearls or rich people displaying their pearls. He thought it was vulgar mm. and uh, uh, to, to display your wealth that way. Interesting. Um, but he's, he, so he has quite a long uh, kind of essay about pearls. And he says that pearls occupied the very uh, very highest position among valuables. Huh. 
So I I didn't realize that. Um, I had that no idea. Pearls were valued more than diamonds and any other jewel, and even gold and silver. Wow. Uh, in the Roman Empire, but it kind of I mean it makes uh, these mentions of pearls in the New Testament really interesting, particularly that you know don't. Uh, the 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 kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price, right? A really valuable pearl. Yeah. Uh, in order to possess that uh, pearl of great price, you know, the uh, it would you, be worth you, everything. The you merchant own. will, yeah. yeah, will would sell everything you own right. in order to get that right. most precious pearl. And the kingdom of heaven is like that. Huh. So that's uh, lovely. There, uh, so one other funny story. Apparently. Uh, so first century BC, Cleopatra and Mark Antony, uh-huh. the, that, that tragic love story. Apparently Cleopatra uh, made a bet with Mark Antony that she could host the most expensive banquet in history. So they're sitting at the banquet. She takes off her pearl earring, dissolves it in vinegar, and then drinks it. Oh my gosh. So, that sounds... They were a little it extra. It does not sound appetizing. Those guys yeah. were extra, you know, Mark yeah. Antony and Cleopatra. I saw that movie. There was a lot going on there. <laughs> yeah, it was. But uh, huh. kind of a move of, of decadence, Yeah, right? really, like, right? Am, like, I'm, I'm so rich. This exactly. super I'm so valuable rich. thing. I'm just going to yeah. drink it. Huh? Yeah. It reminds me, uh, I had the... Uh, privilege of traveling to London last year uh, uh, just for a for a visit. My daughter was studying uh, over in England and I went to Harrods, this very wealthy uh, depart- or up, upper class Upscale department store department in London. Yeah. Only thing I could afford was tea right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and biscuits. <laughs> so, but they had this display of loose leaf tea, and one of one of this, uh, you know, one of these uh, uh, collections of tea or kinds of tea had actual gold leaf in it. Yeah, wow, I've seen that in like certain Le- foods, like super high, yeah. like yeah. high class foods. Doesn't yeah. sound good to like, me, but why would you eat gold? Yeah, I think it's that to show how yeah how yeah. wealthy you are. I don't know. If we have any chefs listening and you have used gold, write in and tell us gold leafing. Yeah. How does it taste? Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. I've somehow so got the kingdom of heaven right. is as valuable as, as pearls. As that, yeah. right. Yeah. For which you should sell all that you have, give up all that you have. Yeah. Uh, in order to, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that sounds hard, but but good. Hard yeah. teaching, but a good one. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to our listeners who submitted these questions. We hope that um, that that was helpful and interesting and enlightening. Um, and if you have a, a desire to go deeper into the Bible, uh, we invite you to our website, enterthebible.org. Uh, And there you can find more podcast episodes like this, a bunch of videos, um, courses and outlines of every book of the Bible, maps, uh, glossaries, um, anything you could need to sort of um, dive in and and get more out of your Bible study. Um, So thank you so much for for being with us today. Uh, And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please um, rate and review us on uh, your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. And as always, the very best compliment you can pay us is to share the podcast with a friend. Until next time.